Jolly podcasts are are definitely in my mind, and this is how I think about them. Like they're a hidden gem of research communications, and in that way, uh, a really valuable tool for branding, right? Because if you can elevate the research that your institution is doing, you can elevate like your scholars. Okay, yeah, totally. People are going to pay more attention to your institution. Hey, welcome to the Higher Ed Storytelling University podcast on the EdUp Experience Podcast Network. This is a show dedicated to helping higher ed marketers tell better stories, create better content, and enroll more students. My name's John Azoni. I'm the founder at Unveiled, and we're a video production company working specifically with college marketing teams to make it easy for them to scale up and even automate their student and alumni success stories through our subscription approach. And you can learn more about that at unveiled.tv, and that's U-N-V-E. E-I-L-D.tv. If you're listening to this podcast for the first time, uh, go ahead and subscribe. We'd love to have you. And if you're wanting your college and university's content to resonate on a deeper emotional level with prospective students, with alumni, with parents, whatever, I want you to subscribe to my free newsletter. Every week I send out tips and insights on creating more emotionally resonant content, including examples and best practices from other institutions, articles and blog posts, that week's podcast episode, and much more. So head over to unveiled.tv slash newsletter and sign up. All right, let's get on with the show. This episode is sponsored by the Inner Circle Studio. Uh, It's a great space here in Clarkston, Michigan. If you ever want or need to record a podcast, TikTok content, uh, anything like that, super slick, ready-made environment. Um, So we are here kind of uh, doing something a little different today. Uh, filming in this uh, in this environment. Um, so uh, I've got uh, my guest here, Robert Lee. Robert is the co-founder and owner of University FM, uh, the higher ed podcast agency. He's also the founder of Professors FM, a podcast network making sense of the world with top scholars. His journey in audio storytelling began as a DJ at the University of Michigan's radio station. And he now partners with higher ed teams to elevate the voices of their institutions. So welcome to the show, Robert. John, I'm, I'm really, really glad to be here. I've been following your show for a while now. I'm really excited, you know, just seeing how how you grow um, and really, uh, you know, take some notes here and there about how you do things. So kind of an inspiration <laughs> a little bit. So a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we, we're doing this um, in person and, and we got access to this really cool studio because Robert actually, we realized uh, we live like 15 minutes from each other. Yeah, <laughs> we connected on LinkedIn and I feel like we were like LinkedIn friends for a few months. And then you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> you live like well, right the thing. Me. The thing is on your LinkedIn, it doesn't say like Metro Detroit. It says like Rochester Hills yeah. or like Rochester. It's like, that's exactly where I'm from. <laughs> so yeah. I had to see you because we both work in higher ed, you know, yeah. so. It's just a coincidence. I'm, I'm glad we you know, we know each other. Uh, Rochester Hills must be must be a hotbed for for talent. I, I was on um, Upwork looking for an animator for a video project, and it was like cast to you know anyone around the world. And I got this one. I'm like, oh, I like her work. I look. She lives in Rochester Hills. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of hidden talent around yeah. here. Um, uh, but I say in general for just Michigan as a whole. A lot of people don't look at Michigan as like a place for like creatives, but it definitely is. Yeah, for sure. Um, All right. So let's start with a little icebreaker. So tell me um, something that uh, people might be. Well, a lot of people know you. So uh, oh, thank you. (laughs) I feel like I feel like we have a lot of mutual friends on LinkedIn. Um, But tell me something that people might be surprised to know about you. Uh, Well, I was going to say, you know, triathlons. You know, I I do triathlons, but I think a more fun one would be uh, recently in the past two months, I've gone to bird watching. Uh, so, uh, a friend of mine, a, a high school and college buddy is really into it. He took me out, uh, one time when we were in California, I, you know, I didn't think much of it. It's just bird watching, uh, but it is really an amazing experience. Um, so first place we went, it was in Bolsa Chica in, uh, Los Angeles area. Mm-hmm. And they just have these amazing bird, like seabirds. And one of them is the, uh, the brown pelican. All right. I don't know if you know what this is, but it's, it's really big. Uh, and when it flies, it's really majestic, and it looks like a Boeing seven four seven. Wow! Right? Um, but yeah, brown brown pelican birds, and uh, something about bird watching. How I describe it to people is like if you wear glasses, the first time you wear glasses and look at like the leaves on trees, they're so crisp and so amazing, like all four K. Uh, and similarly, when you look at birds via binoculars, uh, it's just really mesmerizing just watching them fly around. So that's my little 
thing that not many people know about. Like I am into bird watching right now. That's awesome. Bird watching. My um my grandparents in their in their house like had little uh binoculars. We would like we would look out the window and they had like a little like poster that identified all the birds. So yeah. I'd try to find all of them. Yeah. It is fun. But you do triathlons? Yeah, triathlons. So I uh that's a COVID hobby. So I did that starting like two, three years ago. Um and I I am not so good at the running part, but everything else I'm pretty good, pretty solid. Yeah. And for me, I think why I gravitate towards it is because uh, I love the the challenge of it. Um, and how I approach life generally is, okay, wherever the challenge is, I know I'll get there. I know I'll finish. Maybe I won't be the fastest, right? Maybe I won't get there like the way I intended to, but I know I'll finish. Cool. So uh, it's like a way of training my mentality. Yeah. So. My, my favorite... Um like subreddit to follow is premature celebration and there's this one that came out recently where a guy is finishing he's first in the triathlon and he's like running up from the beach about to cross the finish line and he like raises his hand to like to like celebrate like yeah i'm number one and he <laughs> yeah. trips right at the finish line uh, and uh and then like eight people pass him and he just hey i mean that's still that's still top 10 <laughs> Still top ten. Still top yeah, ten. Something to be proud of. Yeah, but, I can't uh, imagine doing anything for that long and then not not uh, getting you know whatever first place or whatever. There's some lesson in there. Don't celebrate too early. I guess. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, uh, so people you know generally know you from University FM. You work with a lot of uh, <coughs> schools around the around the U.S. Uh, for people who don't know what that is, so just give us a little primer on what you guys do for universities. Yeah, so kind of like what you said in the uh, in the initial intro, University of FM is the higher ed podcast agency. The I think. higher ed. I, yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> we're the only one that's only higher ed. And, I don't uh, know of any others. So this is our space. This is our space, and like our name is pretty good for you know. For so, sure, um, it is a podcast agency. So we do four things at a high level. So it's the uh, strategy for podcasts, the production itself, uh, the marketing for it and then the monetization to help show self-fund. Really quick, like we started about five years ago. And at that time, so I was a DJ at the University of Michigan and my co-founder, my brother, Sean, he was a student at UC Berkeley. He took a different path, but he also started a student podcast and one of my podcasts. And that's kind of the birth of this company because we started realizing, hey, there is a lot of great stories on a college campus um, and let's use podcasts to elevate those voices, right? So from students to alumni to presidents to faculties like professors. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, so there are a lot of higher ed podcasts. Would you agree? I agree. Uh, yeah, I mean, so give us a give us a lay of the land kind of of the, uh, the current state of higher ed podcasts. Yeah. Well, I'd say, um, so when we first started, uh, focusing more in in this area, it was during COVID, and during COVID, lots of uh, lots of universities started podcasts because they're looking at ways to engage with communities, you know, in virtual environments, right? Um, and like inter international um, audiences as well. And so there was this like burst in podcasts during the COVID years, um, and then a lot of them like peered out, um, primarily you know, like for for two reasons: one, either they couldn't keep up the production of the show itself uh, or second when they started a podcast they didn't have a clear vision for it so sometimes or still like today oftentimes uh, when people start podcasts they kind of approach it with a mindset of hey let's interview somebody and maybe somebody more famous or more well known and they'll just get a show started but really if you don't have like a clear vision for the show that also implies you don't know who your target audience is you don't know why it necessarily exists and um, and so you just slowly get less interested and motivated to do it so, you know, big bursts during COVID years, and then, you know, a lot of them stopped. Um, but uh, since then, maybe like in the past year, this year, gradually some more podcasts uh, coming up from the higher ed space. Um, and, you know, podcasts talk about the higher ed industry as a whole, podcasts just for the university, uh, slight increase in podcasts, like, or like a lot of new, a lot of new uh, classes, podcast classes for students. So, some may say it's oversaturated, um, but my my take on this is that, um, yeah, they're like quantity wise, there's a lot of shows out there, um, but you can definitely stick out from the herd 
if you have you know, clear vision and you have clear uh, uh, content strategy and production values. I think it, it is saturated, but but if you're th thinking about it like, you know, every university should have an Instagram account, you know, or, you know, some place where they're publishing content that a prospective student can go on there and get a sense for what that experience would be like going to that school. Um, you know, I think having a podcast is kind of the same thing. It's not, you're not necessarily competing with like the Joe Rogans of the, <laughs> of the world. You yeah. Know, we're, it's higher ed, still, still a pretty niche thing. And, you know, a university podcast probably serves a, a very specific interest and in a specific audience uh, to where you're not competing with all these other, uh, you know, flood the pod flood of podcasts. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely carve out your own space. And I think podcasts as a medium are, uh, uh, lend themselves to like more niche or niche like communities. Um, and when I say niche, I don't mean necessarily mean small. I just mean like focused. Uh, you can really target the people you're going for and build a community around the show. But I'd say uh, in my knowledge, when I look at the majority of higher ed podcasts, not many people do that so well. Um, and maybe that's in connection with how just, you know, how they define or how, how well they define their own like institutional community, right? Um, in some ways, sure. Like, yeah, you should have, you know, lots of universities have their own Instagram accounts. Lots of universities have their own podcasts. But I think it comes down to um, when you do this, do you have a clear vision for what you're trying to achieve with this tool? Right. right. Yeah. And I think there's a good opportunity, and I think you would agree, uh, for scholarly podcasts uh, within universities. There's some some good ones out there. I mean, if people, people are listening to this, you know, the episode that came out last week was Kate Young um uh from this is purdue yeah I love um, Kate. yeah yeah she was fun we actually talked a lot about well we were t for people that weren't part of the conversation before we started recording we were talking about love is blind <laughs> yeah. so kate and i uh talked quite a bit about love is blind oh she's a big fan yeah <laughs> okay um so uh but yeah uh the research series for this is purdue um so that's kind of a, a high level one uh, other opportunities for those kind of research podcasts, but what do you, what 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 are your thoughts on these like scholarly kind of research themed podcasts? Where where do they fit in, in? So so I'll say really quick, you know, when I think about higher podcasts, I uh, I, I group them in certain categories. So like you have your student podcast, the shows that are hosted and created by students, kind of more like a learning experience. You have your alumni podcast, very focused alumni engagement, kind of this advancement side, like more nostalgia factor. Right, you have like president podcasts, leadership podcasts, which are more sharing the uh, the mission of the institution, right, as a whole. And then you have this like research scholarly podcast side. So uh, for us as as a company, you know, just end of last year, we started focusing more in the scholarly podcasting side uh, because we started realizing in in our shows uh, there's just a much higher audience potential for a scholarly podcasts. So. Why I mean by that, like a scholarly podcast to me is a show hosted by a scholar, okay? And whatever research you're talking about or like whatever their subject expertise is in, they can make it relatable to what's happening in the world today uh, in, in a much broader context, right? Whereas like a lot of my podcasts, the example, very constrained. Like mm -hmm. people who, uh, I don't know, uh, like the University of Michigan alumni podcast, that's just geared towards University of Michigan alumni. I don't think Michigan State alumni will listen to that podcast at all, <laughs> no. right? But say there's like a, a a scholar at University of Michigan maybe talking specifically about the uh, like cultural marketing, right? Okay, this is interesting. It, it, it goes outside the realm or the or the you know the walls of the university itself, um, and you can make that really interesting. Just talk about current events. So, I think uh, scholarly podcasts are are definitely in my mind. And this is a, this is a this is how I think about them. Like they're a hidden gem of research communications, and in that way, uh, a really valuable tool for branding, right? Because if you can elevate the research that your institution is doing, you can elevate like your scholars. Okay, yeah, totally. People are going to pay more attention to your institution. Yeah, for sure. And I I've I've been you know saying on this podcast a lot recently that just uh, creating content that's like relevant to like real world problems that like you're, you're sort of, um, you know, marrying the brand with, uh, with what's happening in our culture. Yeah. Um, 
and 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 talking about the research around that i think that's really uh influential um you know i can think of one example from from you know my clients um conversations i've had where there's a student uh that i was we were doing a pre-interview uh for her and i was like you know she she went to she was alumni for uh university of chicago i was like why'd you decide to go study data science at u chicago she's like well i read freakonomics um and yeah. that author is a professor there so i thought that must be a good school i'll go there i mean <laughs> like if you can like if you can like bottle that up you know that and and uh and and really execute that and and that can be a really strong uh you know draw for people who are listening to that yeah absolutely like uh so the the two co-authors that book dubner and levitt so uh, i mean i, I say economics myself at the university of michigan but I, I applied to chicago i remember doing that just because i read for economics right yeah and, and so there's a there's definitely a uh a dark connection behind the scholarly podcasts and the brand value that they can provide like like another big show in the space, or probably the biggest scholarly podcast uh, right now will be Andrew Huberman's Huberman Lab. So he's, uh, if you don't know, he's a professor over at Stanford University um, in their uh, School of Medicine, right? And like that show, like per episode, they get at least a million. And that's just audio only, like not even including the video side, mm. right? And, and it's insane. Um, and those episodes are also like two to four hours long. You know, people really listen to the entire thing as well. And to your point, I'm sure, you know, people who listen to Huberman Lab, some of them might be wanting to go, you know, study uh, at Stanford University just because of this show. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that's true. Quick break here to tell you about how you can scale up your student and alumni success stories without taking on a bunch of extra work to manage with our video storytelling subscriptions. Look, making even one video takes a lot of legwork. There's lots of steps to go through to hire a video vendor, herd all the cats, and then you usually get one video out of that. But what if you could do a similar amount of work, uh, but this time get a year's worth of storytelling content that you can use across the board to highlight your various programs where pretty much all you had to do was find the stories and hand them off, and even that will help you with. Well, at Unveiled, our aim is to take the friction out of telling great stories. So whether you're a big school or a small liberal arts college, you can tell compelling stories all year round and fill your content calendar with video content. And we can get this done for you virtually anywhere in the world, certainly anywhere in the US. The way it works is we're going to batch shoot a year's worth of content and then every month drip out to you one new student or alumni story along with a whole package of additional video content. So you'll get the full length story, which is usually two to three minutes. You'll get a 30 second and a 15 second cut down of that story to use in various shorter contexts. And then you'll get eight topical videos. And those those topical videos are like, while we have this student sitting here on camera, let's ask them whatever we want. We'll work with your school to come up with a list of questions that, that touch on those things that you like to promote. So maybe it's scholarships or career development opportunities or on-campus housing or whatever it is. So that's the package of videos. You'll get that package every month, every single month. And not only can you take those polished videos that we deliver to you and crop them vertically and, you know, make great TikToks and Reels content, but you get to keep all the raw B-roll and interview footage that we shoot. Imagine the possibilities of 12 students or alumni following them around for half a day in classes, in labs, in whatever other visual contexts. And that's just an entire library of B-roll that you get to use forever and repurpose at no extra charge. It's all included in your subscription. So head over to unveiled.tv. That's U-N-V-E-I-L-D.tv and check out our work. You can find pricing information there as well. And if you'd like to chat further, you can book a call with me on the website there. And I'd be happy to talk about how we might be able to support you and also answer any questions you may have. Uh, okay, back to the show. When I go look for a podcast to uh, to consume, usually it's in my car or something. I'll just listen to the audio. Number one, I'm looking at um, what's the problem that this episode is solving. I'm not necessarily mm. looking at who the guest speaker, but is it, is it a relevant problem? in my business that I want insight on how to solve. But then two, is it long enough? You know, cause like if, if it's, if it's like 20 minutes or less, I'm less likely to 
listen to that because I want it to last my whole car ride or my whole walk around the neighborhood. You drive a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I want to sink into something. And I think that that we um, don't give enough credit to like when the content is good, it's just make it however long it needs to be. You know, it's it's but like I think I think, you know, we we let length be the enemy of uh, of, of good content and artificially, you know, choke down you know, the runtime of something because we think that people won't li- I mean, if someone's going to listen to a 20 minute podcast, they'll probably listen to an hour, <laughs> you know? Um, but, I, but what, what do you think like makes somebody listen to something that long two to four hours? That's a lot. Well, I, this is a, this is a very common question I get from people, which is how long should I make my show? Um, and, uh, they're like, most shows are in this like 20 to 35 minute range. And people think it's that range because it's based off of the average commute time that someone takes in the United States, right? Mm. Um, and then, yeah, of course, here are shows that are like less than 10 minutes, right? So there's a more like news-oriented, uh, current events-based, and your shows are like hour plus, right? Um, to what you are saying earlier, I, I, I don't think, or let me put it this way, uh, the more important factor for someone listening through an entire episode is not time it's more so the content itself right and how how well it relates to whoever the listener is and are they taking something away as they listen so so your question right for these episodes are like two four hours long and if i was to use like you real lab example again like it's it's all research that he's talking about um so why does somebody listen to two four hours of research what makes them do that like that's insane uh because you would never i would never read like an hour of of research paper <laughs> personally. Right. It's uh and I, I think it's because it comes back to this reliability factor. Uh, cause how Huberman does it is he uh he takes the key insights from the research uh and communicates them communicates them in a way that uh the average listener can actually action on it, right? Or or just think about it a little bit more deeply right so there's some there's some aspect of this conversational tone of how the research is shared and that goes for these like two four hour long episodes and also for even the 30 minute episodes just purely research right like the the more you can uh make it accessible the better um and kind of ties in with this general concept of public scholarship which is a term that i don't think people outside of higher ed would know but uh but if you, if you don't know, you know, public scholarship is just really the idea of how do you communicate research in a way uh, that's accessible so that people in the general public can use it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I mean, think about it, like the things that I study are I like I like reading studies on storytelling, like the science of storytelling um, and stuff like that. But admittedly, like these studies, you know, you get the, I don't know, what do you call it? It's like in a formal, you know, it's like an abstract. And then there's yeah, like a white paper thing. Yeah. What, and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> like what's, I'm just like scroll. What's the conclusion? You know, <laughs> give me the cliff notes. Yeah. Uh, but I'll read books on storytelling that, that are, you know, long books. And, and because that's more conversational, not conversational, but it's more, you know, just down to earth and yeah. uh, less um, academic speak. Um, and so I would totally listen to two, two, three, four hours of a storytelling podcast. Yeah. I mean, and that's why for me, pod, scholarly podcasts are the hidden gem of research communications, because I think just by the nature of the podcast, it's inquiry led, uh, the conversational aspect invites a like human centered storytelling and yeah, it's niche. So that if, even if you're doing a very specific I don't know, piece of research, I don't know, maybe say like on private equity markets, right? Like you can find your people, right? With the, with the right podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, uh, part of this is I, I, I think there's, there's a lot of potential, right? For scholarly podcasts to, yeah, share research, you know, uh, bolster the brand of institutions um, and like deepen the relationship and trust between the communicators, the higher ed communicators and the faculty side. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what do you think people are craving, you know, out of a research podcast? It's interesting to use the word crave. So, um, you know, as I was researching the Huberman lab, uh, because there's also a lot of posts about, oh, hey, you like, can you trust, can you trust this guy? 
uh, it was like one of those reaction videos, right? And the comments on one of these videos there was a uh, somebody was saying, uh, people uh, are getting through the entire episode. You know, they're really starving for real information. Hmm. Now, interpret that how you how you want, uh, but in this context, it's probably just talking about you know, it, in this age, there's a lot of health misinformation that's going around, right? Or just you know, people saying things that maybe aren't substantiated. Right. Um, There's none of that in the political sphere. No. <laughs> <laughs> so people crave real information. And I think that's true, right? Just by seeing the the growth uh, of humorous podcasts and some other scholarly podcasts, and even just like research shows in general that feature uh, professors and lecturers. Uh, there's a, you know, to me, there's a, there's a very, very uh, uh, big space that's suitable for scholars to fill. Um, scholars spend a lot of time researching a very specific you know, piece of knowledge. Um, they know what they're talking about. Um, so as a you know, institution hired communicator, uh, why not look deeper into using podcasts to leverage the talent that already exists you know, within your university or college? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think scholarly podcasts, yeah, there needs to be more of them. For sure <laughs> and and how how would you like on a practical level how would you um advise that uh schools uh implement this is it like you know their star professor uh, one of their star professors would have their own podcast or maybe there's multiple faculty that each have their own podcast or is it one podcast for the university that has different guests talking about different different research projects like maybe both sure maybe all of the above but so i'm kind of interpreting this question as more like a podcast structure in a way. So um, I, I think my, my go-to would be to have a single host who is a scholar and uh, the single host approach because it's much easier to connect with a person than like a general brand. And I think when you have a consistent host over and over again, you really uh, learn to trust that person over time. Um, I've seen models work, of course, for like, you know, with co-hosts, but still consistent. So that's good. Uh, and then there's some models of like rotational hosts, which which is doable. And, you know, there's some successful examples of them. But I think that just makes it a little harder to build a, a trust element over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, from from that angle, I, I recommend kind of looking at it from a individual level first. But if I was to take this question a little further, you know, maybe like, you know, I think about, you know, why aren't there more scholarly podcasts in the world? And I think there's two big reasons. Uh, one is this production side, like, okay, for like a Marcom team uh, perspective, do you have the capacity to support more than one show or even one show fully? Um, and then the second aspect is this potential misalignment between the goals of scholars and the goals of the communicators. So I'm going to skip that first one and just focus on the second one right now. So... Um, I think for higher communicators, when you, when you hear things like, oh yeah, you can have millions of people listen to an episode or even like hundreds, right? Cause that's, that's still pretty good too. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, Hey, you have a lot of talent on campus. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, Hey, like it's, it's, it's part of your role to, to, to share research. Okay. This all makes sense. Let's, let's do more scholarly podcasts. But I think from a scholar side, uh, there's some real you know hesitations you know one like if you don't have that much media experience um there's some you know natural hesitancy around okay what happens if i get it wrong right mm -hmm. or this this aspect of you know what's what's in it for me like to me i think from our experience there's a lot of great researchers lots of great scholars but there's not but that does not necessarily mean that they're great communicators Right. So that's true. Overall, there's there's some aspects of just how do you make it easier for scholars to engage in pod, in the podcast world? And I think there's two routes. You know, one is for the scholar to actually have their own show. The other is kind of this more like podcast guessing strategy. Right. Um, and yeah, to have your own show. Well, I'll say this way. I think it's probably easier to start with the guessing side just to get a feel for it. Yeah. Right. And just to identify, okay, based on what my current research is, uh, here are some specific shows that 
I, I should be pitched on, right? And then I think as you do more and more uh, interviews on podcasts, yeah, you get more comfortable, you get more in flow, you 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 kind of go through iterations of how to communicate your ideas more clearly for people who are not, you know, uh, who are not experts in what you're studying, right? Who are not like peer academics. Uh, and then I think from there, then you could probably uh, tell whether or not or decide whether or not you should have your own show, right? Or if you want to have your own show. Yeah. And I would imagine, you know, s- scholarly individuals or or professors are pretty, probably pretty good at talking, you know. Oh, so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they might not, maybe they don't want, you know, to be front and center or something. But I, I find, you know, it's it's very different, like, than, than how we might be wired personality wise, because I'm very introverted um, and like any opportunity, you know, to like go to a party or something, I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I want to. Uh, but like, so it seems weird. Like I, you know, I talk to people almost every day on, on this podcast and uh, and I've made and I've made it work, you know, for myself. So really, it really like what was once intimidating for me, like because when I started Unveiled, I was like, I'm not doing a podcast because I've uh, I've seen, you know, people doing before. I'm like, that sounds exhausting, like talking mm-hmm. to people, you know, for like an, so, talking to someone for like an hour, <laughs> yeah. you know, but um, just just kind of dipping my toes in the water. I'm like, oh, it's actually kind of fun. Like it's it's and it's doable. You know, it's it's uh, it's really doesn't have to be that intimidating. And I think I think we really overcomplicate uh, podcasts because there's so many like extracurricular things that you can do with a podcast, you know, with hosting sites, you know, breaking things up into smaller content, you know, distribution, all, all this stuff. It really just comes down to like having an interesting conversation or just writing an interesting script and reading, you know, reading it or, you know, if you if you can do that in a conversational way, I would say probably not a good idea to just read off of a piece of paper. If you're not very good at that, but <laughs> hey, that's just acting by that point. Yeah. But um, it can be easy to overcomplicate podcasts. Um, I, I just think as core, as long as you're very clear with who you're trying to talk to or talk with um, and you have a clear vision for like what success means to you which may not mean high downloads, maybe it's just like, you know, really high uh, listen through rate or like just people reaching out to you to be guests, right? Um, and that, and a third part here, you know, if you're very in tune with who you, who you are as a person, so you're not, you don't feel like you're acting, uh, it's just more, um, I guess, raw in a sense, but more real, I think it's better, more real. And okay, I mean, those, those are three, you know, ingredients for a good podcast. Yeah, for, for sure. So tell us about, um, tell us a little bit more like about Professors FM, like what, uh, mm. how, how do you envision partnering with schools? How is that different from University FM? Yeah, so University FM is the podcast agency, kind of more like production marketing support wise. Uh, Professors FM is a podcast network. So it is a collection of scholar hosted shows, um, all you know, kind of this peer community uh, covering different academic fields. So right now we're starting with more business oriented shows, but next would be like science technology. After that, probably like arts and sci- uh, or like arts, the arts. Um, and our vision for this um, is for all these shows to support each other. Uh, with like audience growth um, and also, you know, this this aspect of helping the shows grow to a point where they can have sponsorships and self fund so they can just be continuous. The mission of the network, or I'll say this, like why, why do we make it, right? Uh, one reason is just because, yeah, we were recognizing that scholarly podcasts have much higher potential than other types of shows. And there's a, there's a, need for this type of show. For me more personally, I think it'd be fantastic for these conversations, for these research-led conversations uh, to get to public discourse and inspire more thoughtful discussion. Mm-hmm. And and for research to have a bigger impact in the real world. Like it'd be amazing to me if uh, you know Professors FM becomes a place where people uh, go to 
for accurate, relevant, and interesting information. And that fuels some conversation with their friends or colleagues. Um, and it's it's all you know backed by some research, right? It's, it's more substance based. Mm -hmm. uh, that'd be really, really awesome. Why? So the question that um, once you get into doing a podcast that people might be asking is why should I join a network? Yeah. I know I've asked that question for, for myself. Um, uh, you know, we're, this podcast is part of the EdUp Experience Network. Um, and it's been great. Like just like the collaboration with, uh, with other hosts, um, everyone just kind of repping each other's shows uh, and sharing ideas back and forth, like with our, with the network that this we're a part of, we have a ongoing like LinkedIn group chat, which is awesome. People just asking questions all day long. And just, it's just like a, a total ongoing con conversation of people just like helping each other out. So, yeah, you know, with that in mind, like what for professors FM, like why, why would a scholarly um, podcast like want to join a network? Yeah. Well, I think like from one very tactical standpoint, it is the audience growth, right? It's, it's identifying shows that have uh, shared audiences or, or like complementary audiences where if one were to collaborate with the other, they both benefit from it. Um, I think the other important aspect is this pure community. Uh, so pure scholars going through the exact same podcasting, uh, I guess, growth, right? This journey. There's definitely questions that are gonna come up um, and it's just helpful to know that, okay, someone who is working in this very similar space has gone through this and can ask them for advice. Mm -hmm. uh, as a network, we or our goal is to make it easier for scholars to engage in podcasting. And so one aspect of that is sure, okay, we can help with production and marketing. There's a other aspect of this uh, for like media training, right? And like guest placement. So for those who are newer to the space. Um, the way I see it, like the, the path to be, okay, even if you have had no, uh, no like media experience in the past, uh, you can go through this media training. We'll help you get placed on podcasts that makes sense for you. You know, get some reps in for interviews, kind of refining, um, refining how you talk about your research and your work. And at some point, Hey, yeah, if it makes sense and you really want to, uh, go all in on podcasting. Sure, let's let's explore having your own show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's all, the media training too. Is that's a big one. Um, you'll because I think you you learn after you guest on your first podcast. So it's like, oh, I should have maybe done this differently or said it this way instead or introduced myself in this way or. Um, but yeah, I think that's cool. That's really cool what you guys what you guys are uh, helping schools with because it's just such a wraparound like comprehensive. I mean, with the with the University of FM uh, side of things, such a rap, um, comprehensive service, um, and then and then to extend that into a a, a, a very catered like network uh, that's all helping each other out. It's like I love that you're just kind of expanding this this whirlpool of value, you know, for universities. Yeah, and and the way the way I see it, um, or like why why I I do this work. Um, is really to support the why I think it's the purpose of education. Um, and I think like through sharing this research in approachable ways by helping more scholars uh, elevate their voice, um, the the value of education or higher education can be, you know, can, can reach much, many more people, right? This whole idea of, hey, you're learning this information uh, in order to better understand the world around you. Yeah. And that's that's why I do this work, right? To, again, elevate these scholarly voices so more people can understand the world around them um, and ask more questions. Yep, awesome. Well, I can say, you know, Robert, uh, you know, speaking to my audience here, uh, Robert has been a, a really great uh, friend uh, as a fellow podcaster. I mean, I've I've gotten a lot you know, we message back and forth on LinkedIn about, you know, questions and, and helping each other out. And, and even just that 
has been has been helpful. So um, Robert's a cool guy. I think you should uh, connect with him. If people wanted to connect with a cool guy, uh, <laughs> how would they connect with you and uh, University FM, Professor that's a, FM? That's a shy endorsement. <laughs> Robert's a cool guy, John. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I can I can be reached via the website, which is university.fm or professors.fm, um, and my my email is just robert at university.fm, and you can find me on LinkedIn. So, uh, and I'm pretty sure if you if you Google my name, Robert Lee, especially if you add Robert Lee Michigan, you'll find me. <laughs> okay, so that's the easiest way. Yeah, awesome, uh, cool man. Well, thanks for being here. This was this was a great conversation. Um, Excited. I'm super excited for people to, to learn about Professors FM and uh, hopefully get involved. Yeah, um, it, that'll be really awesome. And even if you're just going to be a listener, please go check out the shows. The website's live. We have eight shows on there right now, all top scholars from the institutions, and they're all really, really fascinating. Cool. So. All right. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks for listening. Three things I want to give you before you go. Number one, reminder to sign up for my free weekly newsletter all about creating content that resonates emotionally with your audience. And you can do that at unveiled.tv slash newsletter. Unveiled is spelled U-N-V-E-I-L-D. Number two, if you've enjoyed this episode, share it with someone. Share it with your team, your boss, your dog, whatever. And if you're not already subscribed, I'd love for you to do that. Uh, number three, reach out to me. If you have comments, questions, you want to talk about a video project, whatever, my email is john at unveiled.tv. John is spelled J-O-H-N. Or follow me on LinkedIn. If you're searching for me, my last name is spelled A-Z-O-N-I. That's all for today. And I look forward to catching you on the next episode of the Higher Ed Storytelling University Podcast. Thanks. Thanks.